our speaker is going to, is going to have lots of information that you can use. Uh, so our speaker, uh, our speaker is Jan Triplett. She spoke to Launchpad Job Club years and years ago, maybe ten years ago, and uh, you may recognize her because she is free. She is featured frequently in the Austin Business Journal. In fact, she was in last week's Business Journal, I believe. As a, as a spokesperson on uh, startup companies, entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, you also hear her on the radio very often. I've seen her on TV. She, is the, she helps people start businesses and uh, do research. Several of our members have, have worked with her closely. She does a great job of uh, giving you assignments for how to do a market analysis and how to decide if this is the right job, the right uh, endeavor for you and so forth. She's full of information about doing that. And uh, the topic of her talk is starting a business isn't scary. Uh, so uh, lots of you are going to be thinking about consultancy businesses, being self-employed in different areas. And so I'm sure you can all take lots of notes and learn from our next speaker, Jan Triplett. Give it up for her, please. Thanks, Kathy. So nice to be here. Are you hearing me okay? How about the back? I have a very loud voice. Um, but they said I should wear this, so I'm wearing it. Um, I have an idea for you because I do a lot of mentoring for South by Southwest. Would you like to talk to me? I'd like to talk to you. Do you know about a program uh, that is run through? Now, don't don't fake out on me, okay? It's called ISIS, but it has to do with event coordinators, okay? It's a national organization, and it is specifically putting event planners and photographers and caterers, et cetera, together. So if you want to know about that, you come talk to me, okay? So I didn't come to give you job opportunities. I came to see if I could help you feel a little bit better about what you do. So I changed the title a little bit because I want you to think about this as an opportunity. How many of you ever had a lemonade stand? Raise your hand. OK. Uh, keep your hands up. How many of you uh, delivered a paper, newspaper, or anything delivered? OK. And how many of you knew somebody who had a business? All these hands should be up. Look at all the entrepreneurs in this room, OK? Because if you knew somebody who, was, who ran a business, guess what? You were part of it, particularly in Texas, because we are a community property state. How many of you tried one before and decided it wasn't for you? OK. And how many part-time entrepreneurs you, would you guess there are in the United States? And I'll tell you, it's more than a million. Anybody want to guess? Uh, not three billion, but 95 million. And so there are lots of opportunities to do a part-time business. And that's how I got started 32 years ago. So this is what we do. We grow businesses. We take them to the top. We provide all of the steps that it takes to get there. Uh, and my friend Mark is standing over there. He's been a speaker for me for one of the presentations uh, that we do. So we do some free programs, including a mentoring program. And somebody was going to hand out my handouts, because I, I want to know how you feel about what I'm presenting to you today. Uh, these are the pieces you need to grow a business, but you don't need to do them all at once. And so it doesn't have to be scary or overwhelming, but you have to think about this as a big total something. And so that's what I want to talk about. There is no free lunch, no free parking, no free money. Okay, All the money you get is not free. It always has strings. How many veterans do we have in the room? Okay, do you know about the veteran loan program to help you start a business? Yes, no? Okay, that's an opportunity. Do we have anybody in this room, and you don't have to raise your hand, who has a disability? One of the least known programs in the entire state, and maybe in every state, Kathy, is a program run by DARS, the Department of Assistive and Rehabilitative Services. And I have worked with, the, with that organization that agency for about 22 years, because I've been in business 32 years. I've also been through six downturns, so I do understand where you're coming from. I've also been fired, let go, and quit. So I really do understand where you're coming from. But this DARS program is kind of what the um, Department of Systems and Rehabilitative Services uses as a last resort program if you cannot aren't physically able or mentally able to hold a job. Now, that may sound, oh, well, it's only for people who are legally blind or deaf or whatever. But it could be a head injury, it could be a back injury, all kinds of things. 
They don't promote it. I promote it. So if you do have that or you have somebody that you know of who really is looking for something and they're not able to tell the job, go up on uh, the east side or south side and tell them Jan sent you. They, they'll, they'll send me a nasty note, but I want you to know about it. Because it isn't money, but it's stuff, including technical assistance. And I'm one of the technical providers. And when I left the university, my first job was working uh, at Travis State School. Have any of you been around Austin long enough to remember that? OK, well, I was assistant uh, director of staff development. And so I saw lots of people come and go. And the, uh, the job club and the launch pad mean a lot to me. Kathy, I've actually been here three times. I was here with you uh, over at the workforce. I was with Laura Faulkner. Any of you know Laura Faulkner? Remember Laura? She's getting married. And she built her business, and she's been doing really successful at that. So I was there, uh, and then I was one other place with you. So it's really fun. Thank you so much for inviting me back, because I think anyone who wants to start a business should. So let's talk about it. I want to talk about, this is Halloween, so I thought I would kind of get the scary out. And because starting a business has a lot of emotion to it. Uh, and these are the myths that most people think about. There's no money. So I've already told you there is money. There are all kinds of other money. The, the, the uh, tamale house lady, I knew the, the lady from the tamale house, and I'm sorry about her passing, but I'm so excited for you, and I want you to make sure you come talk to me for free, okay? This is all for all of you also. I have a sign-up sheet. If anybody would like to talk about a business idea or a concept or multiple concepts, you know, just like Mark deals with, I deal with people who come in with 20 ideas and we get them down to five and then usually down to one. Uh, but one of the things about uh, starting a business is this perception that there isn't any money. And there is. Uh, the crowdfunding issue that she raised, um, some of you might have looked at that as a possibility and thought, well, that's a little complicated. It is. It's not, there are, you, you don't get anything without strength. And there are some new rules that have come about that you have to be aware of in order to make it work. So I have a mentoring program that I do with Texas Entrepreneur Networks. Um, you're certainly welcome to, uh, I brought some applications for that. It's a free program. Uh, we meet on the third uh, Tuesday uh, of each month except December. I only take seven people at a time. I realize that's not seven, that's seven. Uh, I, I do understand higher math, okay? Um, but it's an opportunity for you to meet with mentors to talk about your business and to get some help. So those opportunities are out there. There is money. Uh, no customers. Uh, maybe some of you think, well, you know, everything's taken. You know, nobody's going to come to me because I'm new. I've never been out there. I've never done anything. Um, the first customer is always the hardest to get, mainly because of you, because you're concerned. And so you pass that on. But there are government customers, nonprofit customers, just as Leap to Success. Uh, one of the, the people I know is part of the Leap to Success program. It's doing very well. I'm so glad that that program exists. So there are lots of opportunities to get customers, even for free, to then help launch you. So it's really about thinking strategically about how to do that. All work and no play. How many of you heard that every small business owner works 160 to 200 hours a week and no vacation? Well, if, if they are, they, they end up um, at a place uh, that I uh, <coughs> talk about, at, and because I work for Travis State School, it's okay for me to say that, they end up at ASH, the Austin State Hospital. There's a specific room for entrepreneurs. It has no windows. It, nobody ever gets fed. That's not the deal. The point of running a business is for you not to work hard, but to work smart. Uh, and the last one is failure. Now. Uh, we have uh, some people here uh, who come from cultures where failure is not an option. In America, not a problem. In Austin, if you haven't failed at least three times, you're, all, you're not trying hard enough. Okay? So how many of you read or have heard about a magazine called Inc? Inc Magazine. Okay, Inc Magazine talks about startups, and it talks about all kinds of things, and then it has a yearly thing called the Inc 500. Anybody heard about the Inc 500 list? These are the 500 fastest growing privately held companies in the US. We used to run something called the Entrepreneurs Association, which was Texas's largest private small business development center. And our yearly event was an Inc. 500 dinner. 
The very first one we did back in 92, which will tell you I've been around a while, uh, was uh, we invited the Inc. 500 companies to come and by the time we, the list came out and we did the dinner, so the list comes out August and we had the dinner in January, two of them had already failed. Wow, right? Well, a couple of years later, we had a company called Educare. Uh, and I write for, a, for allbusiness.com. Uh, you might want to look online. Uh, I'm not the only writer. I also write for the Texas, uh, uh, the Business Bank of Texas. But I wrote an article about uh, in failure is the seeds of success. Because using him as an example, let me tell you about him. He failed seven times. He tried this and he tried that. He tried this thing over there and he tried that. Nothing worked until, until he came up with the last idea that he thought had no merit. That's what became an Inc. 500. Not one year, not two years in a row, but three years. It was completely unheard of. And it was just an amazing story. And when we used to do this dinner, we had everybody tell their story. And we had the guy who owned a computer company that lost his family, lost his car, lost his dog, lost his wife, was delivering pizzas. And he had the day that he was going to give up. He had gone to work for a pizza company delivering pizzas, you know, with a little flag on top, with a little uniform and a little hat and a little thing. And he had met that morning with an investor saying, if you su support me, we can get this business going. And it was uh, computer inboxes. So it's been a while. But my point to you is that guess what happened the night after he, that he met that investor? What is the worst thing you can think of that could happen? No, the investor called that shop for a pizza. And guess who they sent? Yes, they sent him. And he realized it. And he got in his car and he took the pizza and all the way he was driving, he said, do I do this? Do I dump the pizza and leave and just dump the job? No. I'm serious about this business. I met this guy. I tried to tell him how serious. I'm going to screw my courage to the sticking point, as Shakespeare would say. Got out of the car with the pizza, knocked on the door, and said, hello, I'm delivering your pizza, and are you going to give me money for my business? And the guy said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> It doesn't have to be scary. There are lots of nice people out there to help you. And so there always are customers. And failure is, in Austin, an option that you want to embrace because it means that you're trying and it means that you are finding out new things. Um, somebody was talking just earlier about you know, how you learn things, and that's really important. So I want to share a couple of myths with you and then ask me questions as we go along because this is impromptu, all right? But I wanted it to be fun rather than you go down and you register a business or you don't. Um, you know, you do this or that. I can tell you all that. I have stuff like that for free on my website at ownersview.com. I have a checklist of how you start a business in Travis County or in other places and in other states. But let's talk about what it's really like to have a business. So every small business wants to be big, right? Wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Guess how many Guess if there are more small businesses or big businesses in the Austin area? Small. small. How many more small businesses would you, would you guess than big businesses? A lot. <laughs> Out of about 32,000, what we call micro businesses, which are under 10 employees, 19 employees, excuse me, uh, we have about 29,000. So out of 32, we have 29. Okay? That's 19 and under. When you get down to five and under, almost all of that 29 are five or under. I have five employees. I've had eight, but I have five. It's a comfortable number. I like five. I can win with five. So what I'm suggesting to you is this is silly. Don't think about it. There are people in this town, and a lot of you computer people probably know who I'm talking about. Uh, who think, well, if you're not going to build a 300-person business, you should be flushed down the toilet. Well, if you did, you would take 150 to 200,000 people with you because you hire that many people and you put yourself to work. You're paying the taxes. So don't think that you have to be big. Business success is all about sales. All I have to do is have the perfect product to get customers. No, you heard 
them talk uh, at leap to, uh, yeah, leap to success about some of the people who need accounting help, etc. It's a whole business, not just that. The customer is king, right? The customer is always right, right? No. no. Why wouldn't the customer not be right? They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. Absolutely. And they're not the expert, and they're not perfect, and they don't know you. So I had a, had a customer once who wanted me to take the business. And you have to understand that when I went in business, my corporate, the name of my corporation is called Diener Triplet Associates, Inc. I run a family business with a husband of 32 years. And yes, we do still talk to each other. And our offices are not that far from each other. Uh, but we, have, we do business as the Business Success Center. But what I want to tell you about is that I had a customer once who, when we had the Entrepreneurs Association, said, well, why don't you do this thing? And I said, that's great if I'm a nonprofit. You know, I'm not a nonprofit. Oh, OK. So you're the one who has to be the visionary for this, not the customer. And that means you have to change customers, right? So over the years, even though Kathy talked about my focusing on startups, I don't focus on startups, but I do a lot because I want everybody to get a chance. I got a chance, somebody gave me a chance, and I want to give that to you all or to anybody who calls me. So anybody who calls me always gets an opportunity to talk to me. But the point here is that the customer is not king, you are, or queen, could be, okay? All right, um, you can't be fired from your own business, okay? Your spouse or significant other can fire you, say it's you or, or somebody else. Uh, we had a uh, company that we worked with that was a very successful company uh, the man who ran it uh, was expecting a child. The child came. The child had Down syndrome. Um, the business got better. Uh, they were working a lot. Uh, the wife said, you have to choose. Either you run this retail business or you have a family. And he came to us and he said, what do I do? What would you have said? Go with the family. And that's what we did. And we told him that. And he now runs a very successful uh, program for Downs children uh, that includes a garden and all kinds of things. And for the, the sustainable, I work for, I uh, volunteer for this, the uh, uh, farmer's market, part of the Sustainable Food Center. And if you don't know, there's a wonderful urban gardens thing going on tomorrow, uh, which would be fun for people to go to. And, and they take volunteers and they take workers, so if you like working outside, that might be an opportunity for you. Every big business was small first. That's true. I mean, IBM didn't come poof, and all of a sudden it was big. Or Dell. You all know the story about Dell? It's a lie. Okay? He had lots of money. He almost went broke. He failed his family. They bailed him out. Gates, same deal. Okay? If you don't have a lot of money, what do you do? You find a creative way to get started. So how much money do you think it takes to start a business? Okay, what's the minimum in Travis County that you could start a business for? 13 bucks. That's if you register it, okay? If you don't register it and you don't, you're not required to in Travis County, in some cities and in some states you are, but if you got 13 bucks, has everybody got 13 bucks somewhere even in the change uh, in your couch? Okay, so there's, there's no excuse there, right? Okay, so every big business started small. Uh, most millionaires are small businesses, but you know what the problem is? It's all tied up in their business. So one of the reasons that you have to think of the business as whole pie is you have to figure out how to make the money so you can do what we call an exit strategy. You can take the money back out. And even in the co-op that you have, there are going to be people who are going to want to back out. Okay? So you have to think about that from the very beginning. How many of you have ever worked with somebody that you thought maybe this would be a good person to be in business with? Anybody? Okay, well, yes, I, there she sits right there. So, so we're going to exclude you from this. So one of the things that I see a lot is people get scared. And so they say, will you go in business with me? I like you. I want to have you by my side so I don't have to do this scary thing by myself. The problem is once you say that and you call this person your partner in Texas, they are. Okay, so don't call anybody your partner unless they really are, because you don't have to have a piece of paper that says that. You're not my partner, okay? No offense, no offense. 
All right, so you have, there are some things you have to be careful of, and, and I'm maybe sort of overwhelming you with sort of little things, but I want you to kind of get the wheels rolling and, uh, and churning. Uh, there is money to be made in small business uh, by figuring out what you can do to make it so you don't have to do it. The reason that you get out of 160 hours, 200 hours, 300 hours a week is because you figure out a better way. How many people in this room are systems people? That doesn't mean you have to be a computer person. You, you, you're organized. You think in terms of lists. Anybody a list person? Okay, you list people, you're going to have a successful business sooner than the people who are not list people. Okay? I can guarantee it, 32 years later, work with accounting firms to zoos. If you make lists, your mind thinks in terms of how things operate. And that's the key to making a business successful. Questions so far? Yes, ma'am. Um, you were asking us how much it takes to start a business. You say it's more like the average cost of what it takes, one of the $13. Well, it depends upon, you know, somebody's back there said it depends. If you have a consulting business, a dollar. You know, uh, well, actually, it's about $10 because you have to get business cards, although you can go to Home Depot or, I mean, not Home Depot, but, you know, Office Depot or whatever, which now owns everything, uh, and, and get some cards. Or you can print them on cards and cut them out. It really doesn't take what you think. Now, if you're going to do something, uh, in our mentoring program last time around, we had somebody who was a microbial engineer now. <clears throat> okay, so to get his business going, he needs $5 million. Okay, so it's a big range. But if it has anything to do with services, uh, cleanup services, all kinds of things, is, is it really doesn't take a lot. And you know the nice thing about doing services is particularly if you can do what we call strategic alliances, is they will pay you or help you get started. In other words, if you're using my product, I will give you the product for free. I will give it to you for 90 days for no charge. I will do, excuse me, all kinds of things to make it work. And so it really, you can start a business with nothing. When we started our business in 82, uh, we were a uh, communications and training company in the oil patch because my partner came out of PTEX, the Petroleum Extension Center at the University of Texas. We thought oil was going to be there forever. It was, it was boy, it was $20 a barrel, whoa. Uh, and in 83, it was $5 a barrel. So we had to reinvent ourselves. We went down to our last $42. Uh, and we got jobs, uh, part-time jobs, and we ran the business on the side. And I was the woman who called you on the phone and said, would you like to have your picture taken? Oh, I should say this to you since you're the photographer. Uh, and uh, so we had a bullpen of people. And my husband, uh, went because he worked his way through school doing French service. For those of you who don't know what French service it is, it's wonderful. It's crepe Suzettes and Bananas Foster and fancy stuff. Okay, so he went to work for the Driscoll Hotel. So we were trying to do the business on the side, and he came home and he said, you know, the Driscoll Hotel has a major problem. It has 150 employees and it has no job descriptions, no policy book. Everybody's running around like a chicken with their head caught up. And so he said, why don't you go talk to, to Chris Bush, who's the general manager? Okay. So the next day, he walked into the, to the general manager's office and said, I'm Dan Diener, that's his name, uh, and I grew up in the restaurant business, and I've been working in your restaurant, in your high-end restaurant, and you have these problems. And Chris said, you're hired. He said, fine, but it's as my business. And so that was what turned us around. So you really can find opportunities to go from being an employee, even, to being somebody who is separate and uh, apart. Now, you have to be able to kind of have a couple of things. So how many of you like to control your own destiny? Raise your hand. Good. That's a good sign. How many of you like to be creative? OK. How many of you are finishers? How many of you are versatile? OK, there's a list of eight traits. I have it on the website. These are all things that's, that when I meet people, I'm looking for in the people that I work with because you have a better chance of making a successful business than if you don't have those characteristics. Now, the one thing about that I think is probably a big issue for some of you is how often small businesses fail. How many of you heard that most small businesses fail? Did I? You wanna know why? That's because many years ago, many years ago, 
before any of you, maybe we're 20, no, not quite that far. Um, but the Small Business Administration's executive is an appointed, <laughs> okay? So <clears throat> before the 70s, before the 80s, back, back a ways further than that, they appointed a gentleman, very nice gentleman, uh, they gave him a script. Script said, you're supposed to say, of all the businesses that fail, most fail within the first five years. He said, all businesses fail. And he didn't want to lose face, so it's been gospel ever since. It was, I was a uh, part of the White House Conference on Small Business. And one of the things that we kept fussing with the SBA about is what is the definition of failure. Now you might think, well, everybody knows what failure is. Just like those of you who know PMP know that everybody knows what a model is. No, they don't, and they didn't either, all right? So what they were saying was failure was if I had a business and I went into business with you and I closed my business, my business was a failed business. Hello, I did something smart. I, I did a joint venture with this lady right here. Big businesses do it and they don't call it a failure. When we were working, one of the first jobs we did uh, was for TI. Anybody remember the TIPC? No, you've never heard of it, have you? We have two. Oh, there's somebody back there. Oh, another person. Yes, it was a really nice machine. It was much better than the, than the IBM uh, because the G descended. So those of your designers know what I mean. It went below the line. It actually looked like a G instead of a funny nine. Uh, but I, uh, TI was so sure that their product was so great that well-engineered that everybody would buy it. Now, Apple... Uh, and IBM knew that you had to get people to show it to get people to buy it. So they were in sales mode and that's what they did. Uh, and in that instance, in that job with that customer is what we found was that uh, the customer was so in love with what they did that they were willing to risk everything. It went belly up, which was fine with them because they locked off a whole project and then on page three it told how they got an 800 uh, million dollar defense contract. So for big businesses, they don't care. But when it comes to us, if we do anything that looks odd to anybody who's in a big business, they consider it a failure. So bear in mind, you won't fail. The failure rate now is very low, and it has to do with failing, or closing your doors, owing money. If you fail because, well, if you, if you close your doors, not owing money, but because you decided this was not the right thing for you, that is not a failure, my friends. That is smart. That is doing the kind of planning you're supposed to do. So just remember when you think about that, that that's not, not true, not, won't fail. What is, what is the percentage? Uh, it, it, the percentage uh, depends somewhat on whether it is a minority business or not. Or and there are lots of businesses, I see a lot of people who have gray hair. I have gray hair under this, you just can't see it. Uh, is that's one of the fastest growing areas. But the percentage of failures defined as I'm talking about is about two to three percent. It's really low. Now that doesn't mean you'll be a millionaire, but it does mean that you could, instead of having a job or having to go out and, and, and do those kinds of activities to get a job, you could do the same kind of activities to get a customer. Okay? And the key is how do you know who are the customers to go after. It's very similar in some ways to looking for a job. So the failure rate is very low. It's particularly low in Texas. Uh, if you are living and breathing and doing anything in South Texas, you're a success. I don't know if any of you have been south of San Antonio, but you can't drive there. You can't eat there. You can't stay there because everybody in the whole wild world is there. Uh, that's because of Eagle Fort Shale and things of that sort. Same thing is happening in West Virginia. Same thing is happening in North Dakota. Illinois, Pennsylvania. I mean, there are certain things that are great places to start a business. Now, if you started a business in East Podunk or Detroit, although Detroit has some possibilities, uh, you know, you might have a different thing. But in Texas, this is not an issue, particularly because Texas is a business-friendly state. We don't have a business tax. Yes, we do. We just call it something else. Okay, so the key thing here is for you to think about any partners you have are most likely to be the significant people in your life. And what you don't want to do is to work so hard that you don't get a chance to be with them. And so you do want to encourage them and participate with them. Not everybody uh, is cut out to have a family-run business. It has its ups and downs. Uh, we started a program a number of years ago 
uh, called Working Together Without Killing Each Other, because <laughs> it is. I, I had a, a husband-wife team, and the wife called me in the morning. She said, if you don't get here, I'm going to kill it. So we got that settled. And so it's really about putting goals together. It's supposed to be easy, guys and gals and midnight pals. It's not supposed to be hard. This is not the Calvinist ethic. You don't have to slave, OK? It should be easy. It should be fun. It should be exciting. You should want to get up in the morning and do something. So I have a client that I'm working with, and we're trying to figure out where he wants to go. And he said, I want to figure out what makes me feel good about getting up in the morning. He has a very good job, but he doesn't like the job. He wants the control. He wants the creativity. He wants the things that we talked about. Don't be spooked. It, their businesses do go through eight stages of growth. And I will tell you that the research shows me uh, and continues to show me, God bless you, uh, that about 50% of you who start a business about five or 10 years from now, you'll be doing something completely different. I'm doing something completely different. I was doing something a year after I was doing something completely different. And that's why you have to be versatile and you have to be a finisher. You have to be able to adjust. I do recommend a book to you called Mini Trends, M-I-N-I-T-R-E-N-D-S, by the Vanstons. This is a, a family business. We do a lot with family businesses. This is um, father, daughter, son, daughter-in-law. There are lots of them. Okay? It's kind of like Whole Foods. When I, uh, one of our early uh, clients was Whole Foods Distribution Company, uh, which was where they put the people whose last name was not the same as Mackey. They put all those people in there. Uh, that's a little joke. Uh, but my, my point to you is the mini trends will give you some ideas because it's about how do you find little trends within big trends that are too overwhelming for any of us to tackle, like world peace. Okay? We can't tackle world peace, but we can do a little something. And so the Mini Trends book talks about that. And uh, Carrie Vanston uh, and her father, Dr. John Vanston, are going to be my speakers for one of my boss talks coming up. Uh, and that's free. It's an online thing. And you can see it from it wherever you want. Um, the key, as I said, is all parts are connected. So what we want to be thinking about, and you can't see it, but there is a little ghost writer in there. Any of you know the, uh, the poem, The Highwayman? Okay, riding, riding up. Do you remember what happened to the highwayman? That's okay. Well, the highwayman is killed. He, he fought the best. The landlord's daughter is in love with the highwayman, and she, you know, they strap her down and, and they put a gun under her chin uh, so that she won't warn him. And he comes up to the door and she fires it before she's killed. And the highwayman is so irate that he just goes on the rampage. So that's my highwayman. That's one of my favorites, which is, has nothing to do with anything except that I like the picture. So these are the three things you've got to have the right model the right concept and the right customers paying the right price. So it doesn't help you if you are somebody who raises watermelons, or in my family's case, pecans, uh, and you charge less than it costs you to build. You cannot make it in, up in volume, OK? If it costs you $5 and you only get three, you're never going to make it up, all right? So it has to be those three things. But that's not a lot of stuff, right? You just have to know it. But it takes a bit to think about it. And that's what people like me are all about. So are you owner material? What we're talking about here is do you have the willingness and the desire? People who go into business and stay in business, as, people, as opposed to people who go into business and find a job. So I had a, a, a client who went into business with the uh, direct idea that he would do this until he got a job. And he did. And that's fine. That's, certainly a legitimate kind of business. I mean, the Chamber of Commerce might not be too happy, but it's a, it's a perfectly responsible way to do things, is that, that they will not have as much desire and willingness as somebody who's willing to slog it out. I said to you, we've been through six downturns. We knew in 2008, we actually knew in 2007, 2006, where things were headed. After you go through these a while, you get to recognize them. Um, you know, oil is up. Or it will go down. We live in a boom and bust state. That's what happens. And you have to be able to adjust to it. My, my point to you here is that if you are a 10-10, high desire and high willingness, is that you're going to have a really good chance of making it work. If you're less than that, you probably are a great manager. And if, you're, and if it's different than that, then maybe a secretary. All right? So we use these 
uh, models as a way for us to find owners, but also for our owners to find staff. And that doesn't mean that managers and assistants aren't important. It just means that they're, they're looking at it a different way. But it does mean if you're an owner, don't hire a 1010, because what will happen? This person on the end. That's right. They'll go into business for themselves. Okay? Small businesses are training grounds. We expect to be training grounds. We expect people who work for us to work for us for a period of time and then go away, and that's okay. And that's why those people who are do-less and who can figure it out and bring in the next group are going to do better. Hello. Come on. Okay, so don't be discouraged. There are lots of ways to make it work, and there are lots of people to help you, and I've talked about some of them. So this is how you connect to me. And so I am me, Jan Triplett, uh, on LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. I have a form up here. If you would like to sign up, give me your name. I will send you the slides, okay, as a PDF or something. Uh, but, you know, let me know. Uh, and then the Business Success Center, we call it the BSC for short, um, also uh, has a, uh, a Twitter and a LinkedIn and a uh, Pinterest page. Uh, we do, I do, as I said, have some mentee forms. Uh, it, there's no charge to you. The mentors don't charge you. That what they're going to do is they're going to help you a little, and then you're going to decide where you want to go, if you want to go further with any of them. Uh, we do have a LinkedIn group called Mentor Zone, uh, where we post things, uh, and we invite people to post things. Uh, and we do have Wisdom Wednesdays, uh, which is our Twitter uh, for uh, BSC. So we post questions. Uh, I'm, an, as, a, as a Kathy said, I'm one of the ABJs, Ask the Experts. So it's just kind of fun to put up questions and see what people say. These are the events that I was talking about. They are um, diverse uh, because they are really, I'm really trying to uh, address technical issues and inspiration issues and nuts and bolts. And so that's what a lot of this is. Um, so uh, there is a... Uh, Hashtag, if anybody would like to hashtag about it, um, hashtag no scary business, because I don't think business should be scary, and I don't think you should be scared because you are all bright, intelligent people, because you're here, right? You're not out there you know, drinking coffee and sitting by yourself. OK, any other questions anybody would like to ask me? Any technical questions you'd like to ask me? Yes? I want to know about things that you need to set up to start your business, like a fictitious business statement or a federal tax ID form, or some other t um, legal things that you need to okay. start? In Texas, uh, if you, there are different kinds of businesses you could be, from a sole proprietor all the way up and down. Okay, sole proprietor, partnership, corporation, S corporation, C corporation, LLC, LLP, etc. It depends, okay? Sole proprietors don't get salaries, they get a draw. Okay, so you don't, you need, you need a tax ID number that you call the controller, you go on the controller site and you get a number because you're going to need it if you have to pay payroll, uh, have to pay sales tax. There are a lot of things that require sales tax that you don't think do and things that will because I am sure that um, no matter who wins is that we're going to get online taxes. It's just going to come. And there actually is a, a couple of there are a couple of companies out there that will help you figure that out. But in terms of those kinds of things, unless you're hiring somebody, then you really don't need an employee identification number or an EIN number. Or you're a corporation like I am because I'm considered an employee of my own business. So a lot depends upon how you set it up. Okay. Uh, the Small Business Administration has a workshop for years. We used to do the marketing part of it. Um, they charge for it. I think it's $60 now. And I think it's maybe the third Wednesday. I've kind of forgotten, but <laughs> you can go to the SBA.gov uh, or uh, SBA Austin? Uh, uh, score, Austin, I think, is, is where you find it. But most of what you need to do to get a business started doesn't cost you anything but time and willingness and desire. And that's really what the message is that I wanted to tell you about, is that all of that technical stuff, you can pick up. There are lots of people you can pick it up. They picked it up in a class uh, for 15 years. We did a class for uh, ACC, for people just like you, not for students, uh, called the Street MBA. 
Uh, most of my graduates are still in business. Uh, one of them is a company called Concurrent Design. So for any of you who are designers, et cetera, I encourage you to talk to Tom. Uh, they are a multi-million dollar business there. And uh, periodically, uh, we will get together. But uh, about 10 years ago, one of their employees called me and said, are you the people who gave them that book? What book? He said, the Street MBA book with all that stuff. He keeps going back to it every day. I said, well, I guess so. So there are lots of, the, of ways to learn. Uh, the Business Investment Growth Program, um, People Fund has stuff. There are all kinds of ways to do what you want to do. Don't get hung up there. Focus on what is the concept, what is the model, and who is the customer you want to serve. And really, that's the most important thing. These people, they know who they're trying to serve. And they're not trying to serve high-end West Austin. Because high-end West Austin wouldn't appreciate what you're doing. It's kind of like we fill a co-op. Not everybody belongs to we fill a co-op. But the people who do are extremely loyal. And your customers, if you choose the right ones, what we call the platinum profile customers, as opposed to the radioactive waste customers, is you will do well. OK? Does that give you a couple of ideas? And I'm happy to talk to you further or refer you to some people. Uh, when we do our, our first looks mentoring program, we have a little session before that, which is a webinar seminar. You can come, or you can hear it online. And my colleague uh, from Lee and Hayes is an attorney, and he leads that piece. So uh, do think about your intellectual property, by the way. It's really important. Have you trademarked your name? Yes, you've got it registered. And you put it on everything. Yes, good. Yes, ma'am. Well, it kind of depends on what is a living wage. So, yes, I'll, I'll repeat it. So she asked me, how long does it take you to get? And I know you're the lady who's, who tried it before. Right? Yeah. OK. Um, the, the statistics are, uh, are a little hard to measure because it depends upon what is the NAICS. It used to be called SIC codes. Now it's North American Industrial Classification System codes. But most people can get so that they can take a salary of some level if they do their projections. So it, as I said, it's, it's not completely easy, and it's not just about sales. It is about making the numbers work. But generally speaking, you can get some level of profitability, maybe not your full salary, probably within a year. Okay, And that's why you look for strategic alliances to help underfund that. Okay. For those of you who are women, there is a program um, called the uh, Southwest Business Women's Council. Uh, uh, Debbie Bernard leads that. Uh, they're actually out of Dallas. Uh, it's particularly for women who want to do business uh, with very large companies that have a supplier diversity program uh, and who will be a hub, historically underutilized business program. So they, the short answer, when I work with my DARS clients, is what we try to do is to come up with a concept and a model and a customer base, and this is what I do with all my customers, is that they can be in the black within a year. If we can't get them in a year, then we're still not got the right model. Now, that model may include revenue sources, not just from the business. It could be from other things that they're doing or alliances that they have. So it really is being creative. It's being out of the box. And Mark is one of the people who knows a lot about out of the box. I don't know if that helps. I would love to talk to you about what happened, uh, because you've learned a lot. And if you went back at it again, you would do it differently, just as I did when I went down to 42 bucks. I am really careful. I have been stunned. I have you know, had people who didn't pay me $10,000. You know, that happens, and you change your processes to make that work. Yes, Mark? Yeah, it, I started my business. It took me 18 months. Before I started paying myself. Now, I was very aggressively investing, and I had the money to invest. And I'm now at slightly under three years. And so a year to 18 months is, is what everyone told me was. It's about right. Now, I, again, it's not going to replace whatever you got and the benefits from wherever you were. Uh, because you're investing some of that money back in, but some of that becomes tax credits and other things. And the way you make money, of course, is by having other people do the work, which is why you eventually will need an EIN number. 
but those other people could be distributors, they could be a sales channel, there are other ways to do it. Uh, don't forget there are lots of opportunities also to use interns. We, we pay our interns, not everybody does, but there, is way, there are ways to get some help so that you can actually get everything done. The thing that takes time is to flesh out that model, and that's what we focus on with our clients. And as I said, uh, I am happy for free to talk to anyone who is serious about a business, you know, a business model or trying something again. Um, I have a, a form that I ask you to fill out. You don't get to see me if you won't fill out the form because I don't figure you're serious about it. It's two pages, it's fill in the blank, it's not a long thing, but I want to spend my time and your time well. Last question? You have a website and you just got an email address. Yeah, ownersview. Ownersview.com, and that's because we work with owners to take them to the, 40, to the top, which is at the 40,000 foot level. Because if you're down in the muck, that's what you see. Okay? So you, ownersview.com. Okay. Please call on me if you need me. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy.